yo what's going on everybody and welcome back to a new video and i say welcome back but i honestly should be the one who's getting welcome back considering it's been months on months on months since the last bible study video and a lot has happened since then um, i'm currently recording this in january of 2023 and happy new year everyone um and the last part was uploaded i believe july 20th of 2022 so it's been what six seven months since then it's actually been a very long while and i apologize about that and before we actually go into the recap or the summarization of the first three parts of the who is david bible study i'm actually going to give a brief life update because around that time even though I was relatively consistent and arguably the most consistent that I've been when it comes to uploading on this channel. I actually had a lot going on. And so to give just a little bit of background, I believe that when it comes to the Who is David Bible study and studying um, 1 Samuel 16, I actually started, started that study and just writing that notes for my own sake back in, I think it was March of 2020. And so two years later, around May of last year, I actually decided to take my notes, essentially revise them and put them together in a way in which I could put the videos together. And so throughout May and June of last year, I was recording and editing those videos. And then I uploaded them in July and parts one, two, and three were all uploaded in consecutive weeks. And in all three of those parts, I talked about these, this fourth part. And so this isn't the fourth part of the Bible study that I was initially planning. This is actually part three and a half. And I call it part three and a half because I'm actually going to summarize parts one, two, and three, since it's been months since I've actually studied those and talked about those. And then that way it helps to bridge the gap between parts one, two, and three, and part four. But during like May, June, July and August of last year I actually had a lot going on and so not many people know this but in May of last year when I was actually recording the Bible studies I had been traveling for work and I work on the railroad and I had been traveling for almost a year at that point because I started working in June of 2021 and so I had been traveling for a year at this point and I was literally bringing some of my equipment, even though it wasn't too much at the time, but I was taking my equipment on the road with me and I was setting it up and recording in a hotel. And so I did that for three consecutive videos. But when it was time for me to actually sit down and do the fourth part of the Bible study, I think I had grown to a point where I was actually exhausted, not from doing the Bible studies, because I actually find them like really re-energizing and the act of creativity, but more so I was exhausted from all that I was doing for work because not only was I working, you know, just regular, regular 40 hour work weeks, I was also riding five hours on the train on Sundays to work Monday through Friday. And then Friday after work, I would jump back on the train and ride five more hours. And so I was doing this I think I was traveling to and from like Fredericksburg, Virginia, where I was essentially born and raised. Well, not born in Fredericksburg, but raised in like Stafford, Fredericksburg area. And I was traveling all the way up to Philadelphia. And so that was taking place from just about January of last year until August. And so I say August because at the end of August, I actually ended up moving for work up to the city of Philadelphia, where I currently reside. And so during that time, even though I was working, not only was I working, I was traveling, I was balancing the Bible studies. And then on top of all of that, it had gotten to a point where I had to start looking for a place to move. And so just juggling all of those things, it got to a point where I unfortunately ended up like setting the Bible studies aside just so I could focus on all of those other things. Because at the time, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't overwhelmed because I definitely was. It was just a lot on my plate. But even though I ended up moving at the end of August, since then, and over the last three, four, maybe five months, it's just been like a lot of newness in my life where just 
a lot of new things have been introducing themselves, a lot of new experiences, being in a new city. It's just like a lot of newness. And that newness pushed me to a point where like, I just really was like trying to navigate and really figure things out. And so even though I had a lot of systems that were working for me in the first half of last year, it got to a point where like having to navigate through that newness, I kind of, I kind of lost touch with the things that were keeping me like stabilized on a day-to-day -day basis. And so now, January of 2023, when I'm finally sitting down to record this, I feel like I've, I've finally gotten to a point where I'm comfortable reestablishing and being realigned in the things that God is calling me to do, and one of which is the Bible studies. So that brings us to today, the present. And so over the last couple of months, even though I haven't been working on the Bible studies in a more like public manner as to what people will see on YouTube, I've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes. And I don't know if you have noticed or not, but I've made some large leaps as far as investing in equipment or others investing in my equipment and really just being able to help me out so that I can continue to walk this journey of being purposeful for God. And that's something that when it comes to this year, I know I'm going to focus on because I'm the type of person who will naturally focus on the details. I'll naturally focus on like the quality of something that I'm working on. But I think that what God has put on my heart this year is being consistent. And so consistency is not easy. And because it's not easy, it's something that I have been praying for. And it's something that over the last couple of months, like I said, even though like the Bible studies haven't been uploaded to YouTube, or even though like that side of it hasn't been made known to everybody, I've definitely been working on just putting myself into a position where I can comfortably and confidently and consistently walk in what it is that God is calling me to do this year. And so when it comes to that, I'm not 100% sure how I'm going to do it, but I don't have to know how I'm going to do it. I just trust and know that God is going to lead me to do it. And because of that, I'm very excited for what the future has in store because like, I just have a really strong feeling that here going on out, like it's going to be a lot better than what it is that's going or like what it is that has taken on in the past. So I don't want to keep on rambling about me, myself and I, because that is not what the Bible study videos are about. Um, so without further ado, we're going to jump into what I believe many of you guys have actually tuned in for. And that is the Bible study itself. And so like I think I said earlier on, I'm calling this part three and a half because it's not what I initially planned on doing all those months ago when it came to the Bible study. I planned on doing four parts where we broke down 1 Samuel 16 into four different sections. We studied those scriptures and we ultimately wanted to answer this question of who is David. And so the first part is start or the first part starts at 1 Samuel 16. Um, and it's the beginning of the chapter, and it goes on to verse number five. The second part um, covers 1 Samuel 6, verses, well, no, it covers 1 Samuel 16 as well, and it goes verses 6 through 13. And then the third part that we ended up getting to covered verses 14 through 18. And then ultimately, once we end up actually finishing this section of Bible study, um, we're going to go to part four, which is going to cover verses 19 through 23. And just as a reminder, this is what I would consider the first section. I really don't know what to like actually call these sections because we have the parts which are like breaking down each chapter. We're breaking down each chapter into different parts, but then I feel like we also have sections. And ultimately, for this Bible study as a whole, we have three different sections. We have section one, where we're asking and answering the question of who is David by reading 1 Samuel 16. Then the second section is a story very familiar to a lot of us, where we're looking at 1 Samuel 17, 
And we're looking at the story of David and Goliath. And that is looking at David's big win. And then it takes a little bit of a turn, but I feel like it's very important for us to talk about and actually dive into. And we're looking at 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12, where we're looking at David's big sin. And so I feel like all of these are important to really just take a look at because one, when, at least for me, when you're reading the Bible, it's very important to know somebody's character, know who they are and see like who it is that God made them to be. But it's also important to look at their highs as well as their lows, because I feel like that's just the natural progression of life. There's going to be seasons where we're up. There's going to be seasons where we're down. But no matter what's going on in that season, I feel like by studying certain people in the Bible, it teaches us a lot about ourselves. But more importantly, it also teaches us a lot about who God is and how we should interact and build on our relationship with him in those seasons. And so that's why we kind of broke it down into these three different sections, because one, we want to know who David is. We want to see who he is and how God is when David is essentially winning. And then we want to know who David is and who and how God is when David is essentially sinning. And so I feel like at least for when we're studying the story of David, I looked at it and I thought that was a really great way to break it down. And so we're going to go with that for this. But hopefully moving forward with other Bible studies, we're going to see how we rock and roll. That's all I got to say. But before we actually review the scriptures and when I go over the review or the summary or the recap, essentially what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read through my notes that I wrote when I was studying those other chapters. And hopefully the summary portion won't take too long because I want to save most of like the juicy information for those Bible studies in the actual videos that I did. Um, I think each video is somewhere between 45 minutes to an hour and 10 minutes. So there's a lot of information in there. And I hope and pray that the Holy Spirit speaks to you as he spoke through me in those Bible studies. But if you do want to stick around um, and just watch this summary, it'll give you a lot of context as we transition into the fourth and final part but I also highly encourage you to make sure you go check out those first three parts as well. So before we dive into the summary, like I said, we are reading 1 Samuel 16, and I'm going to go ahead and read it in the New Living Translation. I always say this, and I will continue to say this. Make sure you read a translation of the Bible that speaks to you, because the translation or the version of the Bible that speaks to you may not necessarily speak to somebody else. And so I know some people can read the New King James Version. Some people can read the key. Some people can read the King James Version, whereas other people may have to read just other translations. It's all it is is just a different version of the Bible. And so at the end of the day, I believe as long as you're reading the Bible and you feel confident that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you through it, then continue to do what you need to do because at the end of the day, it is dependent on your relationship with God. So I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation. So now the Lord said to Samuel, you have. Now the Lord said to Samuel, you have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. But Samuel then asked, how can I do that? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Take a heifer with you, the Lord replied, and say that you have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you which of his sons to anoint for me. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. What's wrong? They asked. Do you come in peace? Samuel then replied, yes, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see the uh, the Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. 
People judge by outward appearance, but I, the Lord, look at the heart. Then Jesse told, uh, then Jesse told his son, Abin, Abin, Abinadab, oh my goodness. Then Jesse told his son, Abinadab, to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, this is not the one the Lord has chosen. Next, Jesse summoned Shemaia, or Shemia. I'm so sorry. It's been so long since I've read this scripture. But Samuel said, neither is this the one the Lord has chosen. In the way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? Jesse then replied, there is still the youngest, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said, for we will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. Now, once we get to um, verse 14, the subtitle is David serves in Saul's court. Now the spirit of the Lord had left Saul and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. Some of Saul's servants said to him, a tormenting spirit from God is troubling you. Let us find a good musician to play the harp whenever the tormenting spirit troubles you. He will play soothing music and you will soon be well again. All right, Saul said, find me someone who plays well and bring him here. One of the servants said to Saul, one of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem is a talented harp player. Not only that, he is a brave warrior, a man of war, and has good judgment. He is also a fine-looking young man, and the Lord is with him. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse to say, Send me your son David, the shepherd. Jesse responded by sending David to Saul, along with a young goat, a donkey loaded with bread, and a wineskin full of wine. So David went to Saul and began serving him. Saul loved David very much, and David became his armor bearer. Then Saul sent word to Jesse, asking, Please let David remain in my service, for I am very pleased with him. And whenever the tormenting spirit from God troubled Saul, David would play the harp, then Saul would feel better, and the tormenting spirit would go away. Starting off in part one, we titled this video, Stop Mourning and Start Moving, and this covers verses one through five. And so looking at verses one and two, um, we see God commanding Samuel to essentially stop mourning. And as God tells Samuel this, he is basically saying, stop moping and focusing on the past. Get up and get moving, for I, the Lord, have a future plan that is greater than the past. And so just to give like a little bit of background, I think that at this point in the story, God is starting to transition his focus from Saul being king to David being king. And so even though Saul is still king, and I think that he continues to reign as king, God is starting to put Samuel in the position to next, uh, Saul, or no, God is putting Samuel in the position to anoint the next king. And so I believe that this act of like anointing David is actually like, it's only done when they're anointing the next king. And so Samuel is still focused on Saul being king but it's getting to a point where God has already moved on. God already has plans in store that he would like to start moving. But the plans that God has in store are dependent upon Samuel's obedience. And so Samuel is focused on the past. God is focused on what he plans on doing next. And so God is essentially saying, hey, stop focusing on the past and start focusing on what I am currently doing. And so one of the things that I mentioned was that God intends to turn your season of mourning into one of movement. Um, and then mourning the past then prevents rejoicing the future. And then focusing on the past prevents us from fully enjoying what God has ahead of us. And so by focusing on what's behind you, you really can't focus on what God intends on doing in front of you. Um, and I guess, I mean, I could dive into that, but I feel like that's pretty well explained. Like if you're focused on what has happened you can't focus on what will happen. Then I go on to write, 
stop sinning in the past, summon the strength as described in Isaiah 40 verses 28 and 31 to get up and then start moving in your purpose. Um, one of the quotes that I found during that time was from Seneca, who is a Stoic philosopher, and he went on to say, don't stumble over something behind you. And I really like how that's put, because if God is calling you to walk in purpose, don't like focus on the past. Walk in purpose and don't like stumble on the things that are behind you. And then I also go ahead and write um, in my notes that in response to his plan, just like many of us, we sometimes ask questions and have a hesitance towards God's plans. But just like all of our questions, God later answers them with what to do and will even show Samuel in due time. And so focusing more so on Samuel at this point, like one of the things that we see from Samuel is that even though he's curious and has a little bit of hesitance, he responds out of obedience and faith. And so when God gives us a command, when we respond with obedience and faith, God then further responds to us. And so there's nothing wrong with asking God questions. And I personally believe that the Bible even encourages curiosity in us asking God questions, as long as we're asking those questions out of faith. And so we see this in Matthew uh, chapter 7, verses 7 and 8 as well as Jeremiah uh, chapter 29, verses 12 and 13. But I will say that something that I've noticed is that it seems like God isn't as eager to respond to us when we lack faith and have an abundance of doubt. And so during this time, I remember that um, something that somebody had previously said to me was that God will either show you the path, like how to get to where you're going, or he'll show you the destination as in where you're actually going. But he doesn't always show us both of them at the same time, because if God showed us the path and he showed us the destination, it wouldn't require as much faith. So sometimes he'll show you the path and you need to have faith in the destination or he'll show you the destination and you need to have faith in the path. But whatever one God doesn't provide to you in that moment, you need to make sure that faith is filling in. So moving on to verse three and four. Once Samuel gets out of his feelings and prepares for what God calls of him, and I say like gets out of his feelings because when I was reading this, I had to like write my notes in a way that was relatable to me. <laughs> and so like when I think about like being sad or when I think about mourning, and I had to I had to preface this by saying like in this instance, mourning isn't like mourning the loss of a loved one. It's more so mourning the loss of like an opportunity or mourning the past. And so when I, at least for me, when I think about mourning in a modern sense, I think about being in my feelings. And so that's why I say like once he gets out of his feelings and prepares for what God calls of him, we then see that Samuel steps out of faith or steps in faith, excuse me, and then as the scripture said, he did as the Lord instructed. And I love how the Bible put it like that. It just says, and he did as the Lord instructed. And so for Samuel to take this step, it shows his trust, it shows his trust in what God says and instructed him to do. And so when we look at the scripture, and I feel like the Bible actually like says this a lot. And whenever you see it say like, like God said, I will, you have to think to yourself, that is an absolute promise. And I say an absolute promise, because when God makes a promise, nothing about it is going to be broken. It will come to pass because God is true to his word and what he says will come true. It's just a matter of when. But oftentimes when God gives us a promise, he's saying that he will do it. He doesn't say when he will do it. He doesn't say how he will do it. He doesn't say why he will do it. He says that I will do it. And the fact that he said that he was going to do it should be enough for us to believe in the fact that it will come to pass. So in my notes, I continue to say, when God says, I will show you, like I said, that is an absolute promise that will come to fruition after having faith and acting on God's word. So something that's very important to do is, like I just mentioned, don't focus on when or how or why God will do it. 
focus on the fact that he said he will do it. And so after reading like this first, what, four, three, four scriptures, um, we see that God's promises come to life with obedience, faith, and action. And then I put like James um, chapter two, verse 17 in parentheses in the amplified version. And then something that is very, 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 very important to have on a daily basis is faith over fear and doubt. And so something I'll mention once again, once we cover um, verse 14, is that faith and fear cannot coexist. And so where there is an abundance of faith, there is a lack of fear. And where there is an abundance of fear, there is a lack of faith. And so I, I also like listened to this podcast earlier today. And I, as I was listening to it, it really went hand in hand with what I was like saying in this instance. And, and in this instance, I was talking about like faith and fear, how they kind of are like inverse, um, inversely proportionate. That's what we would call it in math. They were inversely proportionate. And so like as one goes up, the other goes down. And as one goes down, the other goes up. Um, but in the podcast, it was talking about um, worshiping and worrying. And so they go hand in hand. So like, um, I think the podcast was by Andrew F. Carter. I think I'll have to like put a card or something in the description. But just like I said, where there is an abundance of fear, there is a lack of faith. And where there is a lack of faith, there is an abundance of fear. And where there's an abundance of worshiping, there's a lack of worry. And where there is an abundance of worrying, there is a lack of worshiping. And then one thing that I feel like is very important for all of us to know is that God's word and his actions only confirm, for they will never conflict. And it's important to know that because that is a part of God's character. God's character is based on confirmation and clarity, whereas the enemy's character is based off of confusion and confliction. And then when we drop down to the last two verses that we cover in the first part, we have verses four and five. And these, I didn't see these like really doing too much except for highlighting like the significance of consecration as well as really just like helping to just progress and develop the story. So I just go ahead and say that these two verses show Samuel being obedient and acting on God's words or and acting on God's instructions. Plus this portion brings these things together or it brings things together that are key for the development of the story, such as Samuel making sure that Jesse and his son were in attendance. And then we also see, um, hold on, let me go to the scripture real quick. Now, in the New Living Translation, it doesn't use the word consecrate, but I believe in the Christian Standard Bible. Yeah, so in the Christian Standard Bible or other translations, I forget which one it is, it actually says consecrate. And that word consecrate means to set oneself apart for God. And so I feel like like consecration is a form of preparation for God's anointing and the fulfillment of his promises. And so one of the questions I just wanted to sit back and ask myself is like, what does consecration look like in modern times? And what does consecration look like in my life? Like in what ways do we as like modern day Christians need to consecrate ourselves so that we can prepare ourselves for God's anointing on our lives in the fulfillment of the promises that he said are going to come to pass in our lives. And so that's kind of where we ended. I just felt like having that open-ended question was a good way to end part one because it really forces you to take a step back, think, and ask yourself like, okay, what ways is God consecrating me? What ways is God preparing me so that one, he can continue to just, you know, anoint me my life and my purpose, but also put that um, his hand of favor over me as well so that we can be prepared to walk in the fullness of what he has promised. And so that is where we ended for part one. For part two, we transition into looking at verses six through 13, and we titled this video, A Heart After Gods. And so on June 7th, um, the version 
verse of the day was um, Ezekiel 36, verse 26. And I feel like I include, I, I think I go into depth about why I include this later on. But just to read that scripture, it goes to say, and I, and I believe it's for, for um, this is the perspective of God, um, or this is God speaking, excuse me. He says, and I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. Verse 27 goes on to say, and I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations or my commands. And so just like considering that David is a man after God's own heart, and I believe, I'm not sure if it's here in 1 Samuel 16 where we see God describing Samuel or God describing David in that way. But I feel like it's important because we are talking about like heart posture and having a heart after God. It's important to know that no matter who you are and no matter where you are at in life, God can and will always touch your heart so that he can soften your heart. And I just take a moment to ask and pray that in any way in which our hearts are guarded or in any way in which our hearts are stony or stubborn and stuck in the ways of our flesh, I just pray God points those areas out to us so that we can then submit them to him so that he can take that stony, stubborn heart out and really give us a tender, responsive heart to him. And so I just ask and pray for him to do that because I definitely know that I need that in many areas of my life. And I feel like, especially in the world and society that we live in, like a lot of people will often try and tell you to prioritize the things of your flesh. And our flesh is that stony, stubborn heart because we're stubborn in the ways of our own human nature. And I just pray that the Holy Spirit, like I said, reveals those things to us, but also touches us in a way so that we can have a tender, responsive heart to God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus so that we can end up walking away from our flesh and walking more so in alignment with his Holy Spirit. As far as verses 6 and 7, I say that these verses are a perfect illustration between what we think versus, um, what we think or assume versus what God knows and has in store. This scripture is more specifically about people, but it serves the same as far as our purpose. Oftentimes we judge a person by how they look as though the quality of how they look then determines the quality of their character. But in all actuality, your heart posture determines who you are and your character. Verse 7 then goes to speak volumes about who God is because he knows all of you and all of us based on what he looks at. In multiple scriptures such as Jeremiah 17 verse 10 and Psalm 139 verse 1, God examines our hearts to see who we are. And unlike, and unlike most of society, God doesn't want or desire you for your appearance or your aesthetic. He desires you because of your heart because your heart is the source of who you are in the life you live. And if God changes your heart, he will end up changing all of you and the entirety of your life. God loves our character, or no, 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 excuse me. I say God loves our spirit and the character that he made and placed inside of the physical you. And God loves all of you. Uh, God loves all of who we are. And so I just, I don't know. I just have to like take a second and like really like sit and let that marinate in my heart because even though like I wrote it out, it really does speak to me because like we really do live in a society where we look at the outward of we look at the outward appearance of somebody and then judge them based off of how they look. You know, I guess the only way that I can really think of right now is like from a like job recruiter standpoint if somebody's looking at your resume they may look at your picture and they may look at your name and they may look at like your outward appearance as though those things determine who you are and it's beautiful because God doesn't do that God knows all of who we are but he looks beyond how we look and he looks at our heart and I just think that I just love that I, I like I love the fact that God examines our character and he examines our heart and it's the posture of our heart 
that determines the quality of our character. So I didn't go on to say in my notes because, and I got to refer to the, my notes, otherwise I'm going to get like just overwhelmed by gratitude just thinking about that. But God looks at and knows you by your heart. And by David being known as a man after God's own heart, it provides a better level of insight as to how his pursuit after God was about becoming more like him. And when I say him, I'm saying him with a capital H referring to David's pursuit after God was about becoming more like God. Um, and when I say that, I'm not talking about becoming more like more like a God, but more so like taking on more of God's qualities and characteristics. Because as we become more like God, we're actually able to draw closer to God because we're putting aside the things of the world and putting aside the things of our flesh. And in doing so, that's how we're able to develop our relationships and grow more intimate with God. But the heart is extremely, 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 extremely important. And I have to emphasize that because it ultimately determines three things. And make sure you watch the second part of the video because I'll probably be able to go more in depth in that video, um, just really describing the significance of the heart. But the heart ultimately determines three things. It determines one, who we are, and that's described in Proverbs 23, verse seven. Two, it describes where you are going um, in the course of your life, and that is Proverbs 4, verse 23. And it also determines three, what it is that you value. And that's Matthew 6, verse 21. And so we also see in like Ephesians verse 3, verse 17, um, where it talks about Jesus turning our hearts into his home and the significance of that, like the significance of that scripture in Ezekiel that I mentioned earlier, the significance of those three scriptures that I just referenced and the significance of this scripture in Ephesians, like the reason that is so important that we submit our hearts to God and want and also allow Jesus to live in our hearts is because by Jesus living in our hearts and by him turning our hearts into his home, it allows him to effectively change the quality of who you are, the direction of your life and what you value. And so like, it's crazy to think that like just allowing Jesus to live in our hearts, allowing his word to dwell in our hearts, allowing his word to really just like marinate. Uh, yeah. Allowing his word to just marinate, like it changes the entirety of what life is. It changes who we are, where we're going and what we value. And so that's so beautiful. Like I said, just, I'm, I'm getting excited just thinking about it. Make sure you check out that second part. Um, as I go into more depth. But all in all, the significance of that is because true outward beauty comes from having a beautiful soul. And so being a beautiful person isn't about who uh, isn't about how you look. It's more so about the posture of your heart. And I just thought that was really, really like really, really nice because we see like we see in verse seven. Like God saying, look, don't judge by appearance or height or how he looks. But then in verse 12, we see it kind of like on the flip side where it says it's describing David physically. It's saying he's dark. It was saying he's handsome. And it's saying he has beautiful eyes. And so it's like, hmm, that's, you know, just interesting. Like, I guess when you think about those two scriptures, because you would think that if verse seven is saying, don't judge by his appearance or how he looks, it at least for me, it caught me off guard reading verse 12 because it's like, well, don't judge by his appearance, but why is it important for how David looks to be included in the scripture? And I think that the significance of that is that verse 12 is saying how David looks, but ultimately, even though it doesn't describe it, David looks that way. And yeah, I would say David, it describes how David looks because at the core of it all, David has a good soul. He has a good heart posture and ha him having a handsome or a beautiful heart posture that's in alignment with God then allows him to be outwardly um, 
it then allows his outward appearance to reflect that. But moving on to verses 8 to 11, um, through these scriptures, we see Samuel continue to be obedient to God and act according to his will. And even though verse 8 to 11 shows Samuel going through the selection process, it's key to look at verse 11. Even after going through what seems like all of Jesse's sons, Samuel then remembered God's promise. And this is so important to keep in mind because God will often give us a promise that will be fulfilled once we fully, com fully complete his plan or his commands. So if Samuel would have quit, then he wouldn't have seen the fulfillment of God's promise. And even when it appeared, emphasis on appeared to be over, Samuel remembered what God had promised and he kept working out of faith and obedience until he completed God's command and saw the fulfillment of his promise. And that's like, that's really, really important for all of us. And I'm going to try and not say too much about that. But like I had to emphasize even when it appeared to be over, because oftentimes in our lives, there's going to be situations where it seems like we're at a dead end. It seems like things are going to be over. It seems like there's not going to be enough for you to make it another day. It seems like, you know, everything is closing in on you. But it seems like that. It appears to be over. But I promise you that as long as you hold on to the like to the promise that God has placed on your heart, and as long as you align yourself with that promise and you align yourself with his spirit, it will only stay that way. So as long as you align yourself, it will continue to only appear to be over. And once you realign yourself, once you remember that promise, and once you walk and work out of faith and obedience, you're going to walk out of what appears to be over and you're going to walk into the fullness and the fulfillment of God's promise. So it does seem like it's challenging to fully understand God's promises because the way in which God intends to fulfill his promises is oftentimes outside of what many would consider logical. And then I go to say this and like, it's just like clear as day. But if what God wanted to do was logical or simple or it made sense to us, then it wouldn't require faith. And it has to be something that forces us to rely on our faith and trust in him. And that, like, I think something that I'm learning as I continue to walk out in, like, my purpose is that God wants us to have faith. He wants us to trust in him. He wants us to believe in him. He wants us to have confidence in him because like, I feel like when you really, like, peel back some of the layers of a relationship, at its core, like, relationships are built on trust. And strong, sturdy, firm relationships are built on trust in someone and having confidence in someone. And so God wants to build your faith so that you can, or no, God wants to build your faith so that he can build the like foundation of the relationship that he has with us. And I think one of the songs that I like, I just constantly have on repeat is that um, I can't remember the exact lyric. But it essentially goes on to say that like stronger foundations and deeper foundations are able to have taller things built upon them. And so if you think about like, a skyscraper or something like that, it's going to have a really, really deep and a really, really strong foundation. And so for something to, you know, for a skyscraper to have such great magnitude, it has to have a really, really deep and a really, really strong foundation. And for us to be the skyscrapers and for us to be the light of the world that God is calling of us, we have to have really, really deep and really, really strong foundations that are built on having faith and having trust in him, but our faith and trust in God can only be built by like testing us. And it, it never, 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 ever feels good to be tested, but the testing of our faith ends up producing those really deep and really strong foundations. And those foundations are then a place for the Holy Spirit to build like the fullness of what God intends to do through and for us. But uh, going back to my notes, uh, the fulfillment of God's promises are dependent upon our faith and obedience. And so 
in this instance and something that i really harped on in that video focusing on part two is that there is someone in this world who is dependent on your faith and obedience to see the fullness of god in their life and so it's important to know that like samuel even though it appeared to be over samuel didn't quit on god's promise because had he had quit on god's promise David wouldn't end up being anointed to be king. And so, like, Samuel's obedience and faith ended up producing the fruit for David to be king. And so, it may not always be like that in our instances where we got to be obedient and, and, like, walk in faith because we have to anoint the next king. But it may be in a different sense where our obedience, our faith, and our ability to walk in purpose, even though it seems like the promise isn't going to come to pass, like, we got to walk out in those things because at the end of the day, whether we realize it or whether we don't, somebody else's promise is dependent upon us walking in faith and obedience. And so, like, us quitting on God's promise as a result of the doubt in our heart can result in someone else not experiencing God's promise in their life. And so it's gotten to a point where like who we are and the things that we do is so much greater than simply us as an individual. And so the citizens of the kingdom of heaven are dependent on our obedience. And so that's why it's so important for us to be like, walking out in obedience, walking out in faith, walking out in the way in which is going to be pleasing to God and fulfilling of the purpose that he's called on our lives so that we can end up doing so much more than what would just consist of us. It's not about just us. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about us as an individual, but more so it's about us collectively so that we can expand and glorify God's kingdom. So my next point is God's promises will come to pass. It's just a matter of will it end up being you or will God have to hand your purpose over to someone who is more willing? And God chose you and he wants you to do it. But are you a willing enough vessel to be a contributor to his plan? So I will say like a couple of the examples like where we really just see like just obedience and faith end up coming to pass. We have like Abraham and Sarah's lineage would ultimately lead to the birth of Jesus. And so with Abraham being known as the father of faith, it's important to know that his faith ended up, his faith and his obedience ended up leading to a much, 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 much greater, like, part of the plan that God had for all of us. And then we also see in Jesus's life where his obedience in the Garden of Gethsemane ultimately led to him dying for our sins. And so, at least for me, when I read the Bible, even though the Bible is relatively old, it's not always the most relatable. And so I had to take a step back and I had to think to myself, okay, how do I make this like modern? Like, how does this apply to modern times where my obedience and my faith ends up breeding something much greater? And so some of the examples that I ended up coming up with is like, One, like, even though I'm a young adult and I feel like this might speak to a much greater audience, like, there may be people in the generations that God intends to come after you who are dependent on you being financially obedient so that they can experience generational wealth. Another example that I feel like may really, really speak to a lot of young men in this day and age, um, whether it's relatable or whether it's not, it's definitely an issue that is persistent that not many people openly talk about. But the people that are to come after us as young men may, may be dependent on us being obedient when it comes to battling lust so that they don't have to fight the battle that we may be struggling against when it comes to pornography. Um, another example might just be people in the church at work. I know that's a big emphasis for me. Um, or even on the street, may be dependent upon us being obedient to share the word of God that he's placed on our heart so that they can experience his love and be reminded that he hasn't forgotten them. And I feel like those are just some of the examples that 
will hopefully speak to a large audience. But even at this moment, I just pray that like the Holy Spirit puts something on your heart where he's saying this requires your obedience so that I can end up moving through you for others. Um, and whatever that may end up being, like, I know I got to pray for obedience and faith on a daily basis. And I, I say daily basis. And it's just about like all the time, every day, because like we need obedience, but being obedient isn't easy when we're constantly flesh, uh, we're constantly waging this battle against our flesh and blood. But to summarize those last three scriptures, um, verses eight to 11, when God provides a vision or a promise, our faith and our obedience must bridge the gap between the vision being a vision and what we will ultimately end up seeing via reality. And then moving on to verses 12 and 13, even though in verse 7 it implies that God doesn't judge by outward appearance, I do find it interesting that the Bible still mentions David's appearance, as I was talking about earlier, but I believe it mentioned David's wonderful appearance because it was a result of his wonderful heart. But towards the end of verse 12, God indicates that David was chosen. Although it isn't mentioned, God has fully seen and, pull, uh, and planned the life of David for every step along the way. And God does the same for our lives as seen in Psalm 139 verse 16. Before this moment of anointing, God saw and knew David while he was in the fields. And just as God saw him in the fields, God always knew the plan he had. And he knew how to allow it to play out for David's good, as seen in Romans 8, verse 28. This is only the beginning of David's story, and it helps us, and it helps to provide further context as to how he feels in Psalm 139. At this moment, God was doing something unimaginable and calling David to greatness. And despite those around him seeming more qualified or a better fit, David has probably asked himself or asked the, the question that, like, we on a day-to-day -day basis, at least I know that I ask on a day-to-day -day basis, like, why me, God? And so I feel like we ask this in the good times and in the bad times, but I know that in due time, God will reveal why we were best suited to fulfill his purpose. And so I say we say this and like, we ask this in the good times and the bad times, because if something is going really, really good, sometimes we thank God, but we also say, why me? And we feel undeserving of it. But in the bad times, we also say, like, why me, God? Like, as though we're also undeserving, you know? Um, and so I think it's just important to know that, like, regardless of what you're going through, whether it's good or whether it's bad, it's meant to happen. And it's not meant to happen just for it to happen for the sake of it happening. God's not just doing it because he wants to do it. God is doing it because he has a reason behind it. And I pray that you have the faith and the patience to know that what he's doing in this season is preparing you for the next season. And so, like, we're going to see this when, when we go into 1 Samuel 17. And, like, when we take a look back from verse or from chapter 17 into chapter 16. But I say that because, like, what God is using in this season is preparing us for the next season because. In this season right now for David, he was in the fields. And so he wasn't in the fields just to be in the fields. God put him in the fields, but he also allowed this season of him being in the field to prepare him for the battlefield. And we'll see that in 1 Samuel 17. And so I say that for all of us because at least for me right now, I feel like I'm in a field season where like I'm just doing you know, day-to-day -day things. I'm tending to my sheep. I'm tending to my responsibilities. You know, I'm making sure that they are well taken care of and they don't get out of hand. But God is using this field season for all of us to prepare us for that battlefield season. And so I don't want to, like, talk about it too much because I don't want to, like, spoil some of the, the juicy information that I want to share in that section of the Bible study. But David was fighting, like, I think, in 1 Samuel 17, it talks about how he was fighting off lions and bears in the field. And so those battles in the field, those challenges in the field, then prepared him to conquer in the battlefield. And so it's important for us, whether it's a field season, if you're in the field season, you're preparing for the battlefield season. And so that should give you confidence. Like what you're doing right now 
is preparing you for something greater. But if you're in the battlefield season, on the flip side, you should also have confidence in knowing that God has brought you to that season because he has already prepared you for that. And so God is either preparing you for what is next or where you're currently at. God has already prepared and qualified you for while you are or for like what you have currently reached. So I say all that because God sees where you are. And just as all things work together for the good of those that love God, all things prepare you for the purpose that God has for you. So I then ask this question, how can the season that you're currently in prepare you for what's next in life? And then I feel like understanding slash learning the reason behind the preparation helps to develop your patience for your purpose. So that was part two. Now we're moving on to part three and the last part that we left off. And that was covering verses 14 through 18. And that was preparation for purpose. So now we're at verse 14. And at this point, King Saul is no longer who he once was. And so we start to see King Saul do what he wants to do. And as he begins to live and act according to his own will, like we then start to see that he lives according to how he wants and what he wants to do. And then at that point, King Saul was essentially no longer living along or in accordance with. And so we see something really, really interesting in verse 14, like in the, um, in the New Living Translation, it says that the spirit of the Lord left Saul. The Lord sent a tormenting spirit and it filled him with depression and fear. And I'm thinking to myself, like, I, I really sat back and I was like, I was like, dang, now why would God do that? And like, like that actually like really stumped me for a while. But I personally think that God intentionally gave Saul this spirit of fear and depression to cause him to turn back to him. And when I say all those pronouns, like God gave Saul that spirit because he wanted Saul to turn back to him. And I just thought that was like really interesting because like this is like the complete opposite of what it says in like 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. But in life, I feel like God will be with us, but he will also cause or allow certain things to happen so that we have to turn back to him. And I think that even though Saul did this to, or God did this to Saul, for like, I also feel like God was doing it for Saul's sake. And I say that like in those two different ways because it's important. God did it, like, depending upon your perspective, you might say, okay, God did it to Saul. And that almost makes Saul look like a victim, I guess. Like, God was doing something to him, you know, and it puts Saul in one light and it puts God in another light. But I personally like to take the approach that God was doing it for Saul, because when you say it like that, God is doing it for Saul's benefit. And I feel like oftentimes, especially when it comes to how we live on a daily basis, like it's important to take a step back and think about all of the things that have happened in your life. And when we take that step back and we take that perspective, obviously hindsight is 2020, but we also have to ask God, like, what is it that he's allowed or caused to happen that he's actually planning on using for us? And hopefully I don't like sound too confusing in this matter, but like, Depending upon your perspective, you might think that some things happen to you, like you're the victim and like you got the short end of the stick. But if you take a step back and all of the good things and all of the bad things that have happened in your life and you say, wow, God did this for me. That requires so much more faith in God, because trust me, there have been a lot of things in my life where. I was frustrated or confused. And I say, God, why did this happen to me? But when I change my approach and I don't ask him, why did you do it to me? Or why did this happen to me? And I start to thank him for allowing it to happen for me. 
like I then like start looking at it. Don't get me wrong. A bad situation is still a bad situation. But like I start like to feel empowered by that situation because I'm no longer allowing that situation to be empowered by feeling like a victim to it. I feel like if anything, by saying it happened for me, I feel like a victor from that situation. And so I think that like in this situation, you know, it kind of takes a completely, you know, different approach when we're taking a step back to analyze it. But like, I guess my question to you is like, how do you see it? Like, do you see God doing this to Saul and Saul is the victim? Or do you see this happening for Saul where God actually has good intention behind it? Because I don't, I don't know. It just, it just doesn't necessarily like make sense to me that God would send a, a spirit that's meant to torment Saul just to do it for the sake of doing it, you know, to fill him with fear and depression just to do it. I feel like more so, if anything, somehow, some way, God had some intention behind it um, to actually use it for Saul and for his benefit so that it could ultimately end up leading Saul back to God. But to continue rocking and rolling with my notes, um, yeah, so God, like, not only does God do this, you know, to and for Saul, but this is also interesting because we see this situation arise and it serves as an opportunity of promotion for David. And so when we look at Saul, we go to see that living outside of alignment with God can cause you to sacrifice the character associated with fulfilling your assignment. But we then also see something very interesting. And if you were going to sacrifice your purpose, then God will substitute you out of it. And in this instance, we just so happen to see God preparing the opportunity. And by preparing the opportunity, it's also an opportunity for David um, to be promoted. And so I just, I, I think that, I mean, it's important to make sure you go back and like watch each part in this fullness because I'm pretty sure I described it in a lot more depth um, because that one bullet, it sounds really grim. Like if you're going to sacrifice your purpose, then God will substitute you out of it. But I, I think I go on to talk about like the reason why God does that is one, to protect your purpose so that he can still like fulfill it. It just might not be through you. But I also believe that he's also protecting you because he doesn't want you to walk in a way in which you actually end up causing more harm um, by like walking in his purpose, but outside of his alignment. Um, and then as we said earlier, mm -hmm. faith and fear cannot uh, exist in the same presence where there is faith, there is no fear and where there is fear, there is no faith. Um, and that's just important because I think I go on to talk about, like, I just reiterate it because, um, like that spirit filled Saul with depression and fear and in the scriptures to follow, like we see David being promoted into the position to essentially walk in purpose and in walking in purpose and walking out of obedience it leaves no room for that spirit. Now, we also take another look at the perspective of Saul. And so this is really relevant because God may allow you to go through something, but he will also put people around you to uplift and encourage you as you deal with the given situation. And most importantly, God will put people in your life to help you turn back to him. And I love this scripture. Um, it's in Ecclesiastes 4 verses 9 through 12, and I'll more than likely end up putting, up putting it up on the screen. And I just love that scripture because it goes on to, like, describe the significance of, like, community. Um, and obviously, it describes it in, like, a biblical manner. But all in all, like, when you're going through a situation or when you're going through something, like, make sure you turn to those around you, not just your community, but make sure you turn to the people that God has put in your life to help like uplift you and like redirect your attention back to him. And I think in part three, I like talk about a couple of examples where like you may be going through something where you feel like you yourself cannot make it, but God will intentionally put people around you that are going to uplift you, encourage you, 
and strengthen you in the ways in which the Holy Spirit needs you to so that you can continue to walk in the purpose that he has for you. But when we look at the perspective of David, God will equip and prepare you for a situation often unknown to us so that he can then use us for his plan. Before being called to play the harp for King Saul, David more than likely had no intention to do so. And this is just an example of how God will equip us for the plans that he has to use us. And though, even though he was equipped to play the harp, David originally didn't see the full value of what he was doing because he didn't see the whole plan of what God was doing. Don't discount the value of what God is doing or equipping you with. Because if we fully saw and recognized the greatness of God's plan, then it would blow our minds to know and understand the value of all that he's doing. Enjoy the entirety of the process because it is equipping you for the promise. And I got to say that last part for me, but enjoy the entirety of the promise because it is equipping you for the promise. Uh, then I just go to write um, to summarize these first or verse 14. Um, when, when things are put in the perspective of your purpose, we begin to understand how what we thought was useless is full of use in God's hands. Now, moving on to verses 15 through 17. After what happened in verse 14, we saw how, or we see how the people around Saul respond. First, they identify what Saul was going through, and then they proposed a solution for him. Even though these are Saul's servants, it still goes to show the significance of who was closest to Saul. In life, we will always be going through something, whether it's good or bad, but your response will depend on your character and those in your inner circle. Saul was already in a low place, and the word describes it. Um, the word says that he was filled with depression and fear. And during these times, you will see who your true friends are, and their true character will be revealed. Even though Saul made the decision to find a solution, his servants were still responsible for finding a way to solve Saul's troubles. So I then asked, like, I made these couple of statements. Um, just to bring about like a little bit of clarity as to who may be in your inner circle. But the first statement is it's easy to be loved when uh it's easy to be loved by those around you when you are on the mountaintop, but true character and intentions are revealed when you find yourself in the valley. And then I have these two questions. Are those that are around you directing you to or distracting you from purpose? And then the second question is, are those around you problem solvers or problem causers? In this case, we see um, like we see a lot of the people, like we see a lot revealed about the people that are around Saul and their response to where Saul was reveals a lot about where their heart was at the time. Um, and then moving on to verse number 14 or verse 18 um, and the last verse for part three, uh, verse 18 is an amazing example of letting your character and appearance speak for itself. Throughout his youth, David more than likely focused on himself and his assignments. And while doing so, those around him became familiar with who he was and recognized his character. And so when your focus is on God and becoming more like him, people will then see the anointing on your life before you have the chance to act in according uh, before you have the chance to act according to said anointing. And so I like this because like David has like this silent confidence that I pray that like we're able to walk in and radiate. Um, and I go on to say that he's not just confident in who he is and like his confidence is rooted in his ability, but more so the reason that David was confident was because of who God is and David's confidence was rooted in his, David's confidence was rooted in knowing who God is in his abilities rather than knowing who David himself was in his abilities. But David didn't have to boast about his shepherding skills or his harp skills, for David knew his value and was confident in his character, and others began to learn his value and his character by the way he lived. After focusing on who he was and his assignments, People naturally spoke highly of him and sought after him. By focusing on himself and trusting God, 
God was able to work on David's behalf and promote him to the promises and places that were destined for him. And so these are kind of like the last couple of points that I'll make, and then we will wrap the video up. Um, but like, I just want you to know that God has made you to be very, very special. And not has made you to be special, you already are special. And whether you know it or whether you don't know it, God loves you very much and he wants to be in relationship with you. And there's a marking and an anointing on your life. And that mark may only be seen in the spiritual, but it can be recognized in the physical. And then one of the last of the two points is that silent humility that radiates the spirit of God that was in in with David. It's ironic, but silent humility speaks for itself because it gives the space for God to speak while you're silent and submitted. And the last thing I'll go to say is that some people won't immediately realize your value, but God always will. And so I hope and pray for all of us that we're able to continue to live in alignment with God and be confident in who he created us to be. And you may not see it now, but God is inserting people who depend on you and will value you more than you can currently imagine. And I don't say that to like boost your ego or to like boost your pride, but more so I say that because as God is preparing you, he's also positioning other people around you who are going to uplift and encourage you. But the same is also going to go the other way where you're going to uplift and encourage those that are around you. And like I said earlier, it's just, that's why like, we have to walk in a faith in obedience because there's going to be people around us who are dependent upon our obedience in our faith. And so all in all, like God has called us to be um, special. All in all, we already are special because we are called and we are already made by God. And because of that, I pray and hope that you find comfort in who God has made you to be, who he is calling you to be. And what it is that he's calling you to do um, because you're very, very special. God loves you very, very much. And because of that, I guess like the only thing that we could do is be like thankful and grateful for what it is that he revealed in these first three parts of the Bible study. And so regardless of how long winded, long -winded this video may be, I would like to thank you for taking time out of your day to really just set it aside give it back to God and really just sit down and listen as I do these Bible study videos. It means a lot to really see like the love, the support and the appreciation. And I once again apologize for my absence, but I'm just extremely, extremely grateful to be in this position. And I pray that moving forward, I can, I can continue to walk in the fullness of the purpose that God has for me. And I also hope and pray that you are able to do the same. But without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and end the video. I hope you enjoyed. Make sure as always, you show some love and support. As I just said, it is very much appreciated. And I hope to catch you in part four whenever I finally, end, whenever I'm finally able to get it edited or like record, edit and upload it. But yeah, see you in the next one.